welcome to the Monday edition of the Dividend Cafe. Uh, you know, it's kind of a quick and easy one this week, actually, partially because there isn't the melodrama that we had a week ago. And in fact, markets were quite boring. The S&P 500 today was up 0.00%. I think many of you know we don't have that happen very often. Um, but also, I would say that uh, they're just... It was like a little bit of information I wanted to pass on this week in each category, but not a lot or an excess in any one category. So let me pull up a few things here and we'll get into it. I want to start just by kind of talking about the the day that we had with the Dow was down 140 points. The S&P was dead even. NASDAQ was up 20 basis points. The Dow had gone down right at the open a little over 200 points and then it really did zig and zag throughout the day. But again, a, a, a pretty benign day all around in markets, not a lot to report coming off of the big rally day that had happened uh, Thursday and Friday of last week. A um, lot more breadth in the Thursday rally last week, uh, meaning wider participation in the market than there was Friday. But still, nothing changes the fact that you kind of had a big sell off at the beginning of the week that by the end of the week had been neutralized. And so do with that what you please. And, and then today, another microcosm of kind of a boring day. Now, technology was the leading uh, performing sector today. Energy was second. Um, the worst performing was real estate, but it was only down 60 basis points. Um, the bond market was positive again. The yield was down three basis points. The 10-year back to 39 percent. Um, one of the things that I will say, just based on the context of what we talked about a week ago, was that speculative shorts in the yen um, dollar trade are basically, there's pretty much no open contracts right now. So all of the shorts covered. And that they'll end up coming back in uh, to some degree. But it, it, at this point, the notion of getting a lot of uh, recovery from or, or sell off from covering a short that was not going well, I think that trade on the currency side seems to have played out. And we'll see what that means on the equity side. But the whole point of the Dividend Cafe Friday, and of course, the point of an awful lot of Dividend Cafes covering an awful lot of Fridays lately is the valuation excess. That story hasn't even come close to going away. Whether or not the immediate sort of drama of a yen cover, over leveraged excess situation, uh, unwinding a carry trade, that may have subsided for the time being, but I would not be betting that it's, it's gone for good. I just point out that when you see no open interest in short uh, yen relative to dollar, a lot of covering, a lot of short covering took place last week. Um, what else do we want to go through here? You know, I don't want to ignore the the geopolitical side, but it's hard for me to talk about what's happening or potentially happening on on Israel Middle East issues as it prepare as it looks like we're preparing for a potential escalation with Hezbollah and Iran, um, which are one and the same in a lot of ways. Uh, and the reason I say hard to talk about is because we don't know. And news reports um, are going to end up being reliable looking backwards, but those predicting, I don't think, no. So we know there's a bit of heightened volatility there. It's a little hard for me to say that I, like oil today was up uh, almost 4%, like 3.8%. But when I say up, it's back to $79.69. You know, um, it had been in the low to mid 70s most of last week. I don't think oil at eighty dollars is exactly pricing in World War Three, or or pricing in the shutdown of Strait of Hormuz, for example. You know, there's just um, it, not a lot of reason to believe that something dramatic is imminent in the region, and yet there's always the potential of something dramatic and imminent in the region. So I'm going to leave it there. Okay, on the political side. Um, I try to do this in a way it isn't going to upset anyone because it just, I know as a fact, I'm saying the truth when I talk about this presidential race because I get a very even amount of hate mail from people that think I'm talking down President Trump or people think I'm talking down Pres uh, Vice President Harris. 
um, I'm doing neither. I'm just objectively calling the balls and strikes of this race. This momentum has moved overwhelmingly to current Vice President uh, Kamala Harris. That's undeniable. The betting odds are what I'm now referring to. That President Trump, former President Trump, had a 70 percentish range that he would be the winner um, at his peak in the betting odds in the prediction markets. And right now it has gone down to 40 percent. And and uh, with Harris at at sixty, so it's gone from seventy thirty Trump to to sixty forty Harris. Now those things are one data point, and you can take them with polls, you can take them with momentum, you can take them with whatever. I am talking to people inside the Trump campaign, adjacent to the Trump campaign, adjacent to the Democratic Party, various pundits and whatnot that are are you know pretty connected, just an overall beltway some more nonpartisan than others. And and I'm not I, I I know who has what views on all this stuff, okay? I'm trying to gather information as to what state of the race is. And I stand by my belief, I actually wouldn't call it a 50-50 race right now, but I still wouldn't it's not Labor Day yet. The Democrats have not had their convention yet. There's a long way to go. I don't think this race looks like it's going in a good direction for President Trump. And yet markets are not going to respond to that with anything that even when it moves, it's likely still something in the, you know, 53, 47 range of our, as far as probabilities for one candidate versus another. That's because of the divided nature of the country. And it's because of the reality of the Electoral College. Now, um, what I point out here in Dividend Cafe today, what I want to share with you is that I think Harris is more likely than not at this point, certainly more likely than things were looking for President Biden a few weeks ago to win the presidency. But I would also add that the Republican Senate race in Montana has now, it's a very hard state to poll. There's now been about three new polls that have really indicated not a one point lead, but a three, four, five point lead for the challenger, Tim Shee, on the Republican side to the longtime incumbent, John Tester. If the Republicans win that race, then you're going to be, and no and no other race that they're competing for, um, then you're looking at a 51-49 Republican majority Senate. That, I think that's what markets are expecting now. I think markets are expecting Harris to win and the Republicans to hold the Senate. And a lot can happen in the next few months that could jeopardize that Senate seat for the Republicans, that could jeopardize the White House for Democrats. Nothing is set in stone. But I do not believe either side gets to claim, oh, no, we're about to face this awful market response or, oh, no, we're about to or, oh, yes, we're about to get this wonderful market response. I don't I think that the divided government likelihood tempers and neutralizes a lot of those um, left tail or right tail, no pun intended, uh, outcomes. And uh, I will do my best to objectively keep you posted on the way. If you want to get a feel for what markets are probably looking at more than anything else, it's not the Senate seats in Nevada, Arizona, Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania that all look to be three, four, five, six point leads for the Democrat. It's not even the presidency. It's probably the Montana Senate seat. Okay. Let the mail come. This week, economically, you have the CPI number coming Wednesday. But you have the PPI number coming Tuesday. Um, you'll have retail sales coming. There's a lot of economic data this week. The state of inflation could be succinctly summarized this way. There is absolutely no question we're in a period right now of uh, significant disinflation. and that disinflation is a byproduct of supply chain normalization post-COVID and money supply contraction. Uh, it had gone negative at one point. It's now just barely positive, but that massive increase in money supply is long gone. And uh, where you, people choose to put the primary emphasis between supply chain and money supply, I'll leave alone. But my point being both of those things are in a disinflationary uh, thematic. And I would say to you that what is really going on right now in the inflation conversation is the fact that 
some are taking advantage of the fact that disinflation is, is not something that plays out in a linear, consistent, month-by-month -month basis. The trend line is very disinflationary. And some months have more noise than others, and it gets everyone kind of ruffled up a bit. But my view is that that's totally irrelevant, and it's also irrelevant to the Fed. It, it, uh, there, the Fed would conveniently prefer data points that help go in line with what they have to do policy-wise. But policy-wise with the Fed, where we are is that right now there's a 100% chance of a rate cut in September in the futures market with exactly 50% chance of a quarter point cut and a 50% chance of a half a point cut. And the, it's evenly divided as to whether or not it'll be a quarter or half point. But what is interesting is that there is a, uh, let me get this right, is it 70 or 75% chance, 70% chance in the futures market of a full 1% lower Fed funds rate, 100 basis points out of the Fed funds curve by the end of the year. And uh, it's a 100% it's a chance of a um, 75 basis point reduction. So whether it's a quarter each, September, November, December, or 50 and then a quarter, or 50, then a quarter, then a quarter, that's all going to change around in the futures market too, let alone pundits like me saying things. That's why I don't say things. Um, I, I think you're going to get 75 to 100 out of the Fed funds rate by the end of the year, three to four cuts, uh, whether it's a half and a quarter in September versus December, November, all that. I don't, I don't care much. Um, the, you know, the 70% chance of 100 basis points, just keep in mind, we got a couple jobs reports coming and we have a couple more CPI reports coming. And so that those cosmetic r results matter for the, for the Fed, in my opinion. On the housing front, there is a 260 basis point difference right now, 2.6% between a current mortgage rate and what the average person with a mortgage is paying. That is um, as much of a differential as we've had going back to the 1980s. That, to me, is the issue as to when you unfreeze this market. You have to have the differential converge down to something much closer to zero. Maybe there's room for a little uh, spread. But the reason that there's no activity, buying, selling, I don't mean in, in prices moving, but just not a lot of activity transactionally is that differential. And whether that number comes down because the average rate people are paying goes up by a quarter to half a point as over the next year, certain rates reset or something. I don't know that that will happen, um, but maybe that happens. And then you also get 200 basis points out of the mortgage rates to bring you to 250-ish, something in that range. But that differential is the key number. I'm going to keep talking about that as we go forward. What else do we got? Fed, oil. Big week for midstream energy last week with the markets going through all their drama at the beginning of the week. You still ended up with midstream up on the whole week, including Monday, one and a half percent. I did get a question. I'm going to quickly go through and then I'm going to let you guys go on the podcast and video. The answer is written out at dividendcafe.com. But someone asked about the report that had come that Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett, owns more T bills, more government treasury bills now than the Fed does. They're up to about $235 billion of T-bills, and, and the Fed is only at around $200 billion. And that's sort of true, but let's just understand something. A bill, is, a treasury bill is a subset of treasury bonds that is the maturity of generally about six months, three months. I think it can go up to nine months, but it's, a, it's just a narrow definition. The Fed owns 19 times more treasuries than Berkshire does. They're still up at around, uh, Baba, is it five and a half trillion? Because I don't want to get the mortgage bonds in there. Um, four and a half trillion of treasuries. Okay. It's just that their duration is longer. They own very few that are six month maturities and a lot more that are longer. 
And Buffett had sold a bunch of Apple and that generated about $100 billion of cash that then they're holding in very short-term notes that's like a cash proxy waiting to deploy. And so I don't really read anything into that. The Fed is still the significant owner of the of treasuries, but they have successfully gotten a trillion dollars plus off their balance sheet. Um, they're they're still in quantitative tightening. They're only tightening right now about twenty billion a month, reducing the balance sheet by twenty billion a month. It had been uh, closer to eighty billion a month, um, but I think it just speaks to a very different objective. Berkshire managing cash and deployment and tactical opportunity, and the Fed managing monetary policy with the policy tool of quantitative easing versus tightening and balance sheet. Uh, bond purchases and so forth. So just food for thought. Okay. I'm going to leave it there. Um, with you all week in New York, uh, Brian and I are still figuring out who's doing what Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, but in the meantime, reach out with any questions and uh, have a wonderful week. Uh, lots going on as always. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Thank you for reading the Dividend Cafe. Mm-hmm.